18. She's now 35 and living in a group home residential facility. What was your life like before she started experiencing her symptoms? I basically can say just a normal life. I mean, everything was um, fine <laughs> until the illness came and it suddenly disrupted our lives and uh, it turned into a nightmare. So she had hallucinations, delusions, she seen things that weren't there, she was very destructive, very suicidal, always trying to kill herself. I'd come home from work and find ropes hanging in the closet and she'd say things like, Mom, I tried it again but it didn't happen. I pretty much, after a year of that, became numb as I wasn't getting a lot of help from the county, there, you know, back then in the late 90s. and. So I was very angry at the sis that this is what it is and she's kind of like a team player with me, with my daughter. And my, fi my daughter finally, um, you know, loved the therapist and connected well with her and um, she did okay and she got on medication and that stabilized her, but then not really because she, this is the part where I'm getting kind of off a little bit, but uh, she was uh, one of the worst cases they've ever had in Napa County, and I have to say that because I don't talk about it much. Two years were a living hell for my family. She would come in the room with knives and say the voices are telling me to kill you. She would attack me a lot, destroy my home, destroy everything. My son moved out of the house. He just couldn't stand it anymore. And when I found out about NAMI, I just said, there's hope. You know, I'm sorry that I'm crying, but. And I think people sugarcoat it too much. And, you know, if they don't hear exactly what happened, then there are those hard things that it's like, hey, I want to say it, but I don't want to talk about it. Should I say it? And I'm not afraid to say it. It just came out, sorry. So. She really knows how to work the system. <laughs> So I basically had to just um, wait until something happened and that something happened when, like I said, she hung herself in the back. And that was because, and I'm gonna say it, is uh, one of her case managers said, why don't you just kick her out of the house, you know? And I says to her, do you have a daughter? And she says, yes. And I says, can you just tell her to get out when she, if she was sick or she had cancer? This is an unseen illness and this is what you're supposed to be dealing with. And this is my daughter. But we did it because we thought she was giving us the right advice and that's what happened. And then me, I tried suing the county because I felt that it was wrong for them to talk to me like that. And I just tried to make the system better and they said, oh, you can get all the attorneys you want, no one's gonna help you. And I just started giving up at that point and that's when I found out about NAMI and someone was on my team. I felt like I found a family, uh, just a safe place to, where people can really understand where I was coming and help me deal with it, especially my own, because there were a couple times I wanted to end my own life because of what was, it was too much. I mean, I would get people pull up in front of my house. I, I remember, I'll never forget the day a big rig guy pulled over, <laughs> believe it or not, in a big rig in front of my little house in my neighborhood and said, your freaking daughter tried to kill herself. I, she went right, I had to follow her. And, and I'm like, welcome to my world, sir. And he's like, really lady? You know, is there any help for your daughter? And I said, I have to wait until something happens to my daughter. But like I said, the hanging thing. And so now will you guys help me? <laughs> And they said, yeah, and they kept her for a week and they brought her back home. So once again, um, it was laid on my lap and I got special education services through the school and somehow through that, we were able to get her to a program, but nobody would take her. She was too destructive and she wouldn't follow the plan. She would run away. Once again, she'd come back home. She turned into adult. She'd end up in jail, which she shouldn't have been. And then the judge said, okay, then let's try doing something with the county of Napa. They assigned, assigned a, a, count, a case manager for her and they ended up having to send her to Patton State Hospital 
because she did commit a crime after that and she was there for about a year but that's when I started seeing a difference and they did have a NAMI at um, San Bernardino uh, Patton State Hospital and that's when I really got interested in trying to start services in Napa and that's what I'm doing right now we're trying to start our own affiliate with the help of um, uh, NAMI Solano even in my own pain I see the families all around me. I and in in the middle of all that, my my daughter had a little baby. <laughs> His name is Demetrius. I've had him since birth. He's now 10 years old and now he has ADHD. And in the middle of that, he was sexually abused by his babysitter and physically abused, and that brought on the trauma. And um, I truly believe that the symptoms are almost the same as ADHD, and you have to treat that because they, they stay there until they process through that. So I'm barely now getting those services for him, and he is on ADHD medication, but I'm hoping that with the trauma being addressed that maybe somehow we can take them off ADHD. It's a fine line there and very sensitive thing. So um, I'm taking care of her kid now and taking care of her. And it's like, who's taking care of me? <laughs> I have to really be careful, you know, because I'm the lead person for Napa Citizens for Mental Health and I work very closely with Solano. And 2016 was a very dark year for me. I fell into a deep depression, oppression. It, it was the worst thing. I, not, I thought I had a mental illness. And I says, I can't do this no more. I threw up my hands and said, forget my job, forget NAMI, forget everything. I, gotta, I, I, can't, I can't do anything. And so I didn't tell any of the board members and I remember going into a meeting and I just said, I'm not doing well right now and can I still be a part of this and it's like of course you can and they started telling me all the reasons why and I said I really need to hear that because I was feeling pretty weak right now and I want to do something but right now I can't so please give me some time you know so I can get myself together and I am I'm back to work I'm working as a parent partner I've been doing that for 15 years and um, work with the county, with probation officer, social worker, with families. And the families said they love me. <laughs> and that makes me feel special. And it's also therapeutic for me to be able to help my community. And people say, why do you do so much? You know, the other committee members. And I says, I want to help. I want to make the system better. But I have to be careful now because it really affects the families. Yeah. The self-care part for family members mm -hmm. is so huge. It is. You are the advocates. You're the only advocates for your family members. I know. So, <laughs> and then when I fall, take care of you, <laughs> nobody. Then who's going to take care of them anyway? Mm -hmm. you know, so. And it wasn't until my husband said, woman, he said, this is not you. You love what you do. This is something else that's taken over. And I'm going to support you through this, and I want you to hold on. Don't you dare tell anybody you quit. You just need some time. And NAMI, that's when I realized they are my family. They're my friends. You know, they helped me get through it. And it's just huge to me what NAMI has done for me and my family and to give me joy. And I did that after that dark time because I had stopped doing all that. And I realized one day he just delivered me from that oppression. And I, I just feel like I'm back. You know, I'm not going to run as hard as I did, but I'm going to get up and learn from what I've been through and also educate other people on how important it is to take care of yourself and, and not to overload yourself because we can, it, at any given moment, any one of us can be in a crisis that we didn't expect. And peer support is something that's huge with me and that's what got me through it and my support i'm surrounded by nami people and my committee in napa and so many people love what we're doing there and they're joining little by little and and it's it's growing and and it's just nice to see that 
okay, I can, I can get up and dust myself off and, and start off where I left off and nobody needs to know every little detail of my pain, but now they do. <laughs> and it's okay to educate others. But you just have to keep going, keep moving, don't isolate yourself and just do fun things in life, you know. <laughs> <laughs>